We're certainly glad you joined us today. We do trust that our time together in God's Word is a rich blessing and a help as we're going to look back and continue on with our studies and uh, how to gain a strategic grasp of the Bible. And I suggested to you that you can do that, and our series is uh, How to Gain a Strategic Grasp of the Bible in Seven Hours, Seven Hours Through the Bible. Now, this is a half-hour study, so we have to take, you know, a half hour and a half hour to make an hour. And so we're in the five and a half hour mark now. Uh, and we're looking at how to gain a strategic grasp of the book of Acts. And it's extremely important that you understand how the book of Acts plays in the study of, uh, of the New Testament Scripture. The book of Acts is a common battleground in scriptural discussion. And that's because the nature of the book is that of a transition book. Uh, too often the book of Acts, that, that feature of the book of Acts is overlooked. People think about the book of Acts as a pattern for us today. And think about how many, uh, how common it is. In fact, it is, it is the standard, uh, approach to the book of Acts to look back at the book of Acts and the cry back to Pentecost and so forth that we need to go back and use that as a standard for today. But when you begin to study the book, you begin, you, you discover the book of Acts is not uh, the standard for us today, especially early Acts, because what, what it is, rather, is it's a, it's a record of how God uh, extended a renewed opportunity to the nation Israel to repent, trust their Messiah, and that when they refused that, then he set them aside and wh how he was just and righteous in sending salvation to the Gentiles in spite of Israel, not through her. So the book of Acts is, an, is a tremendously important book that you, that you get your bearings in when you begin the book. And we, I suggested to you that Hebrews chapter number 2, and if you look there, uh, verse number 3 and 4 are, the, are verses that will help you gain an understanding, especially of early Acts. And when I say early Acts, I'm talking about the first, uh, say, seven chapters of the book of Acts, the Pentecostal era as it is known. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness with signs and miracles and divers, uh, uh, signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will. If I draw a picture on the diagram here, and I draw a timeline, and I try to take that verse and make a timeline out of it, it's, it's so simple that it's confounding to people. He says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? That's the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In our Lord's earthly ministry, the Lord began to speak some things. He preached a salvation. It began with John the Baptist. It was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They were preaching about uh, a kingdom, uh, the Messiah coming and setting up a literal, physical, visible, uh, earthly Davidic kingdom about some wrath to come that he would deliver the nation Israel from, and uh, this, this wrath to come over here, and then thy kingdom come. And when they, when they preach back here the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that that kingdom is at hand, John the Baptist, it says about John the Baptist in Luke chapter 16, verse 16, that the, king, that, that the law and the prophets back here were until John, but since that time the kingdom of God is preached and all men press unto it. It became the issue. Then Jesus Christ dies, he comes, he, and, and, and Christ picks up the same message, repent. He chooses the twelve apostles, they, 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 uh, they preach repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then they, they gather together a little flock of believers, and that little flock, he, Jesus said, fear not little flock, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So that's the issue back here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then Jesus Christ dies, Israel rejects him, they, they, they don't want him, so they, they say we'll have no king but Caesar, not have this man right over, so he dies, he's resurrected, he ascends into heaven, and then he sends the Holy Spirit on them on the day of Pentecost over here. Now that's what Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4 is talking about. And he says, how shall we, these Jewish believers over here, Escape if we, escape what? Escape this, this wrath to go into the kingdom. If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. The things that are being preached in the early Acts period here, at least in Acts 1 to 7, are exactly the things that Christ preached over here. They're confirmed to us by them that heard him, God the Holy Spirit bearing witness with them. Don't let somebody come along and tell you something new began in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. It did, there's nothing new according to God, God's Word. Somebody says, well, Pentecost is the birthday of the church. Pentecost is not the first day of anything. 
Acts 2.17 says it's the last days, not the first days. There's no church birthed on the day of Pentecost, as the saying goes. The church that was at Pentecost, they, they, they added to the church. You don't add to something if it's already there. The church that's there began back over here, at least according to Hebrews chapter 2. Now, if your church tradition tells you something different, you're free to believe your church tradition, but understand you're believing your church tradition, not the verses in the Bible. Now, I know it's Hebrews chapter number 2, verse 3 and 4, and when you're studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that you, you say, that's a strange place to get light and information. But see, that's the way God's Word is. You have to study all of God's Word to get all the information. Isn't it interesting that God would take a verse out of the book of Hebrews, which fits over here, Hebrews 2 verse 5 says that what they're talking about is the world to come in the book of Hebrews. Takes a verse out of this over here and fits it back over here to explain this. The reason is this stuff back over here applies to that over there, and that over there is a continuation of this over here. You say, but where are we? Well, we're in the dispensation of grace, Romans through Philemon in here. This is where we are. We're through the fall of Israel. That's put that out here with Stephen, and the fall of Israel, salvation has gone to the Gentiles, Saul of Tarsus is saved, made Paul the apostle, and Paul becomes Paul the, uh, uh, Paul said, I speak to you Gentiles, as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office, and over here you have the formation of the body of Christ in a, in a, in a program that's called the mystery. This program back here is called prophecy. Prophecy is that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. It has to do with, with God's plan and purpose through the nation Israel to establish His kingdom in the earth. The mystery has to do with God's purpose and plan to establish the headship of Jesus Christ through the ministry of the body of Christ, where there's neither Jew or Gentile, bond or free, but all made one in Christ. Now this program is where we are now. The book of Acts records the transition from Israel's program to where we are today. So if you want to know how we got the, how, where the change came in and how it came in, the book of Acts is there to document that for you. Now, there are three pivot points in the book of Acts, as I said to you last time. We finished with this last time. Three pivotal points. First is the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Come with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I'll start in verse 14. Acts 2.14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be it this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Notice he's talking. Who he says he's talking to? He's not talking to people living in Chicago and Los Angeles and Milwaukee and Ohio and Timbuktu and slap out Alabama. He's talking about you men of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is not your hometown. Look, get a map, look it up, and you'll see it's in the Middle East. <laughs> Okay? I know what people say, well, you know, that's your home. That's just people don't want to believe the Bible. But these, these were not drunk, as you suppose, seeing as the third hour of the day, verse 16. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. What's happening right here is what Joel prophesied. And it shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. He says, I'm, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit. And, and Peter says, this is exactly what's happening here, is exactly what Joel prophesied. Or to the prophetic program that Joel back here looked forward to and saw. This program over here, Joel didn't see. He saw this right here. And he prophesied about it. But notice Joel said he's going to do two things. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And then verse number 19, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. I'm going to pour out my spirit, and then I'm going to pour out my wrath after pour out my spirit. So Joel says there are two things coming, guys. The spirit, and here he is, and then the wrath is coming. So you start out with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And what the, what the, what the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in Israel's program did is it demonstrated it was a foretaste of the blessings of that kingdom. Come back with me to Isaiah chapter 32. The way Israel was going to be spiritually qualified to receive the blessings of her kingdom, promised kingdom to her, was not going to be through their doing it, it was going to be through God doing it. The new covenant, the difference between the new covenant over here and the old covenant over here is the old covenant said, do this and you'll live and you couldn't do it. So the new covenant says, I know you couldn't, so I'll put my spirit in you and cause you to do it. And the, fun the basic function of the New Testament, of the New Covenant with Israel, is that God was going to supernaturally empower them by His Spirit to keep 
his commandments and to be the nation that he chose them to be. He's going to justify them and sanctify them by his spirit and give them spiritual qualification to be who he chose them to be. And that's what starts right here. And what he's doing is he's empowering that little flock to be the nation that can receive that kingdom. Just as the prophet said, Isaiah 32, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. Looking toward that kingdom over there. Verse number 15. And he, and he talks, verse, verse 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, on down through Isaiah 32, he talks about the, the tribulation period. And he said, you're going to be in that, in that mess until, verse 15, the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a, a forest. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field, and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forevermore. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, and be in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. When is all that blessing going to come? When the Spirit is poured out. So when they got that spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost, it was a foretaste of the powers of the world to come, Hebrews 6 says. It also, in Acts chapter 2, was a demonstration of the fact that Jesus Christ is exalted at the Father's right hand as Israel's Messiah. Acts chapter 3, chapter 2 rather. And by the way, Back here when they were filled with the Spirit, they all spake with tongues, other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you look down in Acts 2, verse 5 to 11, you'll see that there, there are men dwelling at Jerusalem, there for the, for the, for the uh, Feast of, of Pentecost, from all these different nations. There's, there's 12, 15 different language groups that are sit, sitting there. When they spoke with tongues, you know what they're doing? Ezekiel chapter number, uh, uh, Zechariah rather, chapter 8, verse 20 to 23, says in that kingdom, ten men out of all the languages of the nations shall come and take hold of the, him that, the skirt of him that's called a Jew and say, we'll go with you because we've heard God's with you. Now, if one Jew is going to have ten different language groups come along and want him to preach to them, what are you going to need to do? You're going to need to be able to speak in the various languages of the nations. You see, the gift of tongues that, that the Spirit of God gives to the nation Israel is to counteract the curse of Babylonian confusion in Genesis 11 of the languages so that they can take that message and preach it to all these various language groups out here. It didn't have anything to do with so you could have a hoot nanny on Sunday, you know, or some private language that you make yourself feel like you're more acceptable to God because you've got this special language. Listen, all you need to be acceptable to God and be as special as you'll ever be is be in Jesus Christ. And when you need something beside who God has made you in His Son to make you feel special, then you're saying His Son isn't enough. Oh, yeah. Nearer to God, nearer I could not be than in the person of his son. For in the person of his son, I am as near as he. Dearer to God, dearer I could not be. For in the person of his son, I am as dear as he. And if you need some religious experience to add to what God has made you in Christ, complete and blessed with all spiritual blessings, you know what? You got your mind on the wrong thing. Because that religious experience isn't life and it isn't joy and it isn't peace. It's just stuff. It's flesh. Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit, you now made perfect through the flesh? Yeah. I know, that's, a, that's called a rabbit trail. That's not part of my message. It's not going to be part of the notes. If you write and get the study guide, it won't be part of that. That's a little rabbit trail. Not a jackrabbit trail. Jackrabbit trail is a big one. That's a little one. But that's eternal truth you need to settle yourself on. Being complete in Christ and Him being enough. You learn how to write and divide your scripture, and you won't let religious systems come along and confuse the scripture, confuse you by twisting the scripture and taking away from you the joy of just standing fast in the Lord. That's why we do what we're doing here. It's not to prove everybody else is wrong and we're right. Is so that you can have a, something to stand on that makes Jesus Christ everything. And man, me, you, or anybody else, not the issue. Now go back with me, if you will. Acts chapter 2, verse 30. Acts 2.30, Therefore being by a prophet, knowing that God has sworn of an oath unto him, that of the fruit of his loins, he would, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that he sh his soul should not be left in hell, neither his flesh see did see corruption. This Jesus, whom hath God, ra uh, hath God raised up, 
whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, because God has raised him up, being by the right hand of the Father exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he said forth this, which you now see and hear. What Pentecost does is demonstrates that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. God raised him up and has exalted him up here at the Father's right hand. And because he's exalted at the Father's right hand, he's received the gift of the, uh, of the, of the Father, the promise of the Father, and sent the Holy Spirit. What, what Pentecost is doing is demonstrating that Jesus is the Messiah. Now verse 36, verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he himself said, The Lord said unto my Lord, and sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. He sits down up here, but he's going to sit until, until what? He makes his enemies his footstool, right over there. Makes his foes his footstool. Now that's what the verse said. Acts 2, 36, 37. Uh, he, he said, verse 34, 35, 36, he says, the Father said, Come sit thou at my right hand, sit down, until I make your foes your footstool. Now that takes us over to Acts chapter number 7. Because when you come to, come to Acts chapter number 7, you see there's a change takes place. Because in Acts chapter 7, Stephen stands before the Senate and Council of Israel. We call that the, the they, they call that the Sanhedrin, the governing body of the nation. And he indicts them for their crucifixion of Christ, their rejection of him. And he says to them in verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have you not persecuted? And, have, uh, and, and they have slain them which show before the coming of the just one, of whom you have now been the betrayers and murderers. They, he's saying, you guys have this witness of the Holy Ghost here, and you know what you've done? You allowed Herod to kill John, the man sent from God the Father. You demanded that Pilate kill God the Son. Away with him, we have no king but Caesar. Jesus told you, if you speak a word against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven you. But you speak a word against the Holy Ghost, here he comes. It won't be forgiven you in this world or the world to come. You ever heard of the unpardonable sin? That's it. You know who's doing it? Israel, right there. What are they doing? They're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. One strike, two strikes, three strikes. Well, if you're a Cubs fan like I am from Chicago, you know what three strikes are, don't you? Out, brother. And you know what happens? The fall of Israel. Peter says he's stiff -necked. He identifies Israel in the spiritual condition as the Gentiles. Now, you know what they do in response to that? They don't repent. You know what it says they did, verse 54? When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They cried out again, and they stoned him. But while they're doing that, verse 55 says, He being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing. Now, wait a minute. He's not sitting anymore. Now he's standing. Now, wait a minute. He was going to sit, now he's standing, he was going to sit until time to pour out his wrath. You know what's happened in Acts chapter number 7? At that moment, when Stephen sees the Lord Jesus Christ standing, Isaiah 3 verse 13, he says, The Lord shall arise to judge his people. In prophecy, you've arrived at the very point in which the day of the Lord's wrath was ready to be inaugurated. Now you say, but Brother Rick, it didn't come. I know it didn't come. But you were right there as you're reading through the book of Acts. You've reached that climax point where the wrath is ready to come. You say, why didn't it come? Because there was a... The Lord Jesus Christ up here reached down and saved Saul of Tarsus. He came back and, and took his worst enemy on the earth. And rather than destroying him, he saved him, and he saved him by his grace. Look with me at, a, at 1 Timothy chapter number 1 for Paul's explanation. Verse 13, talking about himself, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor. Paul was standing right back here holding the coats of the people that are crucifying, that are stoning, rather, Stephen. Paul said, I before was a blasphemer. He's blaspheming the Holy Spirit right along with his nation. Think about that. If he was blaspheming along with his nation, blaspheming what? The ministry of the Holy Spirit back here in the little flock. 
There's no forgiveness in this world or in that to come. In order to save Saul of Tarsus, God himself had to introduce a new program, one that was not foreseen in Matthew chapter 12, one that was not a part of the program back here in Matthew 12, where, where he talked about forgiving the word spoken against the Son of Man, but not forgiving the word spoken against the Holy Ghost. He had to introduce a new program, a program called Grace who before was a blasphemer and a persecutor, verse, verse uh, 14, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceeding abundant by fa with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. For this cause, for this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. When he said he's the chief of sinners, he wasn't saying he was the worst prolificate that ever lived. He's saying he's the leader. He was the leader of the world's rebellion. He's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's touching the law blameless, the righteousness of the law blameless, Philippians chapter 3. The outward man was blameless as far as any condemnation could be had, but he was leading the rebellion of the world against the Messiah. Howbeit for this cause Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Now watch. Howbeit for this cause... I obtained mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. That Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. Notice these words. To them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. He saved Saul of Tarsus to be the first, to be the pattern of him which should believe on him in this dispensation right here of grace. Now, when you come to the book of Acts, when you come to Paul in the book of Acts, Romans chapter 11, something new's begun. Something entirely new that wasn't there before. You started out with Israel's program. Now you're seeing Israel's program set aside and something new introduced. Romans chapter 11, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. Israel stumbles at the cross. He lays in Zion a, a stumbling stone. But they don't fall. God forbid. They're given a renewed opportunity of repentance. But through their fall, then they do fall. Right here, Acts chapter 7. And through their false salvation has come to the Gentiles, right down here through Paul, for to provoke them to jealousy. And at the diminishing of them may the riches of the Gentiles. So they stumble, then they fall, and then they diminish. And that's what you see in the latter part of the book of Acts. From that point onward, Israel no longer has the opportunity to be the channel of blessing through which the nations are going to be blessed. But God does deal with Israel from Acts 7 all the way down through, through Acts 28. Deals with them through Paul's ministry. Verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. The body of Christ is made up of Jew and Gentile, put together in one body. And there's a remnant of these lost Jews that God wants to, to have saved into that body. And so he deals with Israel as, in, in such a way. That's why you see water baptism in, in the early ministry of Paul. That's why you see the tongue talking in the early ministry of Paul. That's why you see the healing ministry in the early ministry of Paul in the book of Acts here going on that way. Why? It shows that Israel's program, Israel's God, has left Israel and gone to the Gentiles. It tells the Gentiles Israel's God has come out there to you. And there's that provoking period there. And Paul said, I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. And so what's going to follow the book of Acts? Paul's epistles, because that's where we are today. So what you want to understand, what you want to grasp, and what you don't want to miss in, 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 the, in the book of Acts is that the book of Acts is the book of transition. Where you start out with Israel, they haven't fallen. They're continuing on. It's a continuation, a renewed opportunity of Israel to repent right out of the doctrines of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then they come to that with the outpouring of the Spirit to give them the power to be the nation he chose them to be. Then there's that outcry against Stephen where they stone him and he sees Christ standing there ready to pour out his, his wrath. And then God interrupts that prophetic program right at the point where wrath is ready to fall and God interrupts it with an, un, an unprophesied secret program 
where rather than pouring out his wrath, he pours out his grace. And that's introduced with you to you by Christ coming back personally and saving his chief event, his chief opponent in the earth, the leader of the world's rebellion, Saul of Tarsus, and making him Paul, the apostle of grace, the herald of that very grace that you and I can experience today. And our pattern is to join the chief of sinners and trust the Savior of sinners and have everlasting because of it. So our pattern's in here. The pattern for us is not in the book of Acts. The pattern's in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And that just happens to be what we'll start studying next time is Paul's epistles. Can I tell you, if you'd like to have the study guide that goes along with this study, there'll be a phone number and an address in a moment on the screen. We'll be glad to send it to you. Our desire is to help you understand and enjoy God's Word so God's Word can go to work in your life and produce the fruit and the life it's designed to produce because of Jesus Christ. Thanks for being with us. Till next time, Maranatha. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us today. If you are still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven, and that you have eternal life as a present possession, let us know and we'll be happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. That address again is The Message of Grace, P.O. Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today, and God's best until we meet next time for another Message of Grace. Hmm.